great. Hello, hi Paul. It's a pleasure hosting you today to the podcast. And uh, I believe since we have known each other for so long, but uh, uh, you know we never had a chance to host you. So it gives uh, you know really great pleasure to finally having this conversation and uh, looking forward to all the good things that are going to come out of it. So good morning and uh, I hope you are doing well. Why not you start with a brief introduction about things that uh, you have done, things you've been passionate about. Let's start from there. Great, and uh, Ayush, uh, great, great to uh, uh, finally meet you. Thanks for all your uh, help. Uh, Mind Bowser has been a great partner to us over the years. Um, so I'm Paul. I'm the CEO and co-founder of of Shortlist. Um, um, before this, earlier in my career, uh, I spent most of my life in financial inclusion, working in India uh, in microfinance, and then running an, a fintech venture capital fund, investing in startups uh, across India, uh, Africa. And, and other emerging markets. Um, um, my, the kind of through line to my career has always been building businesses that uh, are doing something good for the world. So that are that are working on uh, um, big social problems, trying to address climate change, uh, uh, trying to promote uh, greater equality and equity in the world. Um, um, and uh, uh, that's been as an investor, as an operator, et cetera. Um, uh, it's been exciting, uh, an exciting journey. I think the, uh, um, um, genesis of shortlist emerged because as we were investing in all of these social ventures we kept realizing that the biggest challenge after capital uh, after financial capital was usually human capital it was people it was hiring uh and there was an area where it was harder to get the right support um shortlist of course as as, as you've been on the journey with us has has been a really exciting story where we started as a more of a software centric business. Uh, We're focused on building screening and engagement tools that has kind of migrated into more of a tech-enabled service business, where we uh, uh, work with uh, primarily startups and social ventures across Africa to support their hiring needs, both uh, at a senior executive level uh, level through our executive search offering, and then uh, a side of our business we call Shortlist Futures, where we work on large-scale workforce programs, jobs programs, essentially trying to connect uh, uh, young Africans in particular to careers of the future uh, and, and provide a springboard into um, great earning long-term career and earning opportunities. Happy to go into more detail. Um, um, I uh, uh, spent a lot, many of my years uh, in, in India. I actually started Shortlist uh, when I was based in Mumbai, uh, but now uh, based in Nairobi. Uh, and 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 building the business across Africa with teammates in in India still, uh, but also in Nairobi, in Lagos, in Egypt, and in uh, um, and in UK. So it's been an exciting exciting run. Great, great. So you have been all over the place, as it seems. Uh, you know, India, Kenya, UK, and US, and so on. So uh, did you always thought about building? This way, or uh, over the world, or like, how did it all led to you know creating a good platform and uh, you know the way it is now today? Tell us more. Yeah, we we've uh, we've mostly been 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 led by uh, some mixture of where can we solve the biggest problem and make the biggest difference uh, uh, versus uh, where does our sense of adventure take us? Um, and I I'm from a a small town in Western New York State, where I happen to be sitting today as I visit my parents and my childhood home. Um, but I think uh, um, um, I always had this uh, itch to go out and, and see the world um, and was very fortunate to, uh, after college, get to travel and and, and explore more. Um, initially, uh, I came to India uh, because of uh, it was just an exciting moment in the microfinance revolution. And uh, when I moved to Hyderabad, uh, microfinance was in relatively early days in India, um, but then uh, um, um, was part of a, a massive run-up. So I was at an organization in, in Hyderabad called SKS. I was in, I was around employee maybe maybe 100 or so, and when I left a few years later, it was 27,000 employees. So really uh, exciting run-up. As we thought about shortlist, uh, I ended up then investing in uh, across Africa and India, felt frankly more comfortable and excited doing work in those markets. And it's really where the problems uh, of, of human capital uh, became more clear to us. 
Um, now um, um, we're more oriented towards Africa, uh, and, a, and a lot of it is just because we see a, a, a greater need and a greater opportunity, um, particularly related to youth employment and workforce. Um, so uh, uh, as a continent, uh, Africa is very, very young. The average age is, is 17, 18, whereas in the U.S., for example, the average age is about 40. So the very young population, there's a huge number of people entering the workforce, more people entering the workforce in Africa in the next 10 years than the rest of the world combined. That's a, that's a, a huge, huge opportunity and a huge risk, uh, a huge opportunity if that, the, the potential and the talent of that workforce can be deployed against uh, all the world's um, talent needs and, and, and the problems of the world. Huge risk if, if that population is underemployed, not able to find fulfilling employment, not able to support themselves. Um, and so uh, a lot of the work we're focused on is, is just thinking creatively about where, where are these jobs in the future? How are economies evolving to create opportunities, both in Africa, where things like uh, clean energy, uh, um, um, climate transitions are, are opening up a lot of new career tracks and job opportunities, but also in the global digital economy? where it's becoming more and more common, and, 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 and your business, Ayush, uh, is a great example of this, becoming much more common for people to, to live in one place, but, but work for employers or clients in other places. And so we've been doing a lot more work in, in these like anywhere jobs, not just software engineers, but in fact, a lot of the jobs that people don't think of as digital, things like customer success or sales development representatives or, or designers or other, other areas, um, where uh, uh, we can we can get people connected to uh, uh, jobs in the global economy, and Africa's workforce can become more of the world's workforce. So, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's been an exciting time. Really, it, I mean, from your story, Paul, what I can pick up is that you were never afraid to you know uh, take the extra mile, like first moving from US to India, probably when India was at the cusp of. Uh, the revolution, and then you move to Kenya, uh, you know, where again you're counting on the revolution to happen. So, uh, you know, what gives that courage to you, and uh, uh, you know, what really goes behind the scene when you are making these decisions for yourself? Thanks. Well, it, it, it doesn't uh, I always feel, or I don't always feel brave when doing it, but I think um, I've always considered that the best way to stay on a steep learning curve is to keep yourself uncomfortable. And so whether it's the geographies you work in or the functions you're playing or the sectors you're working in, um, I've always found that uh, uh, the way to keep growing and the way to keep things exciting is once I get to a certain kind of plateau in learning, let's go jump in and shake things up and do something different. And I found that that working uh, outside of my original home country has been just an exciting way to, to get to know uh, a big range of, of people I might not otherwise meet, to get to know cultures, um, but very, very importantly, continue to stretch myself professionally. Uh, I feel like it adds a whole level of difficulty. So if, you know, as you well know, it's already hard to build a business. Um, but if you layer on top of the, the difficulty of building a business, also trying to do it in one or more cultures that is not necessarily my native culture, um, it uh, um, uh, it kind of ups that difficulty even more and and, and creates um, some fun learning opportunities. Um, I've also just uh, personally just found it so fulfilling to to to, to be, and luck and I feel so lucky to have been able to kind of live and work in in so many amazing. Uh, uh, places have loved my time in India and have, have loved my time uh, um, now uh, living and working in Kenya and in, in Africa. Right. Of course, you know, loving what you do uh, is super important as well, like enjoying while you build. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, uh, one of the things you mentioned was about, you know, like uh, um, when you started Shortlist, it was more of a software company and now it has become a tech enabled uh, company which is where the main purpose is basically i think to connect the employers and employees and the right talent to the companies so you know what's the difference can you elaborate more and what are the pros and cons if anybody is you know switching gears 
Yeah, I think that uh, um, when we started, we were convinced that the only way to go was to be a tech business, um, primarily because uh, uh, we view tech as as more intrinsically scalable, um, um, and it would it would improve our ability to have the biggest impact. There's still some truth there, but uh, I think that uh, one of the things we've discovered is that. Um, customers' willingness to adopt technology is not consistent around the world and not consistent across functions. And I think as we were developing technology tools to be used and uh, purchased by um, um, companies, particularly small to mid-sized companies and particularly HR leaders, um, I think what we saw was, was what those HR leaders within companies needed and wanted much more was someone to kind of like turn to, call when they were having an issue and guiding them through the process uh, in a more hu high human touch way than uh, a software platform. So while we were having some success licensing the platform, we may be at our peak, we're licensing our, our platform to 600 or 700 companies. Um, we were realizing that we were probably going to struggle to license that to 20,000 companies whereas we were having those 600 to 700 companies beg us to provide more hands-on support and we're willing to pay for it. So I think what we saw was, um, and I think we're now seeing, as you look out in the world, a lot more of this. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, B2B and enterprise SaaS is a huge, huge industry with a lot of applications. But you're also seeing a lot of businesses, pilot jumps to mind, where um, ultimately the offering to the business is, we are going to, we are going to solve your problem. And we are going to, on our side, as the as the uh, uh, as the service provider, we are going to blend technology and and human touch on our side to offer it. But what we're marketing to you isn't a SaaS platform; it's 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 the solution to a problem. And I think as we started to follow the market and listen to our customers, um, um, at the end of the day, we're loyal uh, uh, to the problem, not to a particular solution. And the problem we have always wanted to solve is to unblock human capital challenges for these companies we care about, the companies that are driving the impact and innovation economies of Africa. And what they were asking for was a more hands-on solution. Now we see that um, um, we still very much believe that the business we're building is, is highly scalable, but it is scalable in a different way. It's not just a, a, you know license more and more uh, a SaaS tools. Um, it's, it's, it needs to be scaled in a more human way. And so it's more about building scalable systems for hiring and training high quality recruiters. It's about building the technology tools that our recruiters use to serve our, our, our clients. And it's, of course, about innovating and continuing to see where we can introduce new offerings that are kind of addressing this, this range of human capital challenges that companies might face. Okay. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh... So what are the challenges um, you know, that you foresee in the coming years in this segment of work? Like, uh, you know, especially I think some things may have changed with the hybrid mindset, with remote works and, uh, you know, maybe some of the new technology things that are coming up. So what are the new challenges that you see? There, there I mean, some of the things, there's numerous things that jump to mind. Uh, um, some are challenges. Some are, are really opportunities. Um, obviously, just to get it out of the way, I do think we're in an interesting and, and complicated macroeconomic context, uh, particularly serving startups. Uh, we see that startups, uh, startup funding has slowed down a bit. Uh, we see people kind of questioning some elements of the venture model, the growth at all costs startup model, and still figuring out what will this all mean for tech. Um, um, tech hiring has slowed down. Uh, uh, tech businesses are trying to figure out where future growth will come from. Um, some, some tech businesses like Microsoft, Google, et cetera, have almost found it easier to grow their bottom line by laying off employees rather than hiring new ones. So I think this macroeconomic context is, 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 is of course, going to play itself out. Um, we think that the future of work and the evolutions around remote work and distributed workforce uh, are really, truly exciting. Um, I think it opens up uh, companies' abilities to get the best person wherever they happen to be in the world. And we've loved that companies, I guess, prompted by COVID and accelerated by COVID, but 
whatever the case, we're now in a place where more and more companies are are looking around the world to find the best talent to, to fill their needs. I think that's really exciting and particularly exciting for young young talent in India, in, in, in Africa, uh, who, who can benefit from that, work with great employers, get great experiences, get paid a global wage, uh, and, and and grow their careers. Um, I do think there's challenges there that we see as well, uh, particularly around uh, the the loss of human connection, training and mentorship losses, uh, and just the kind of impact on team cultures when people aren't in the same physical space as often. Uh, even even in our you know office uh, or our, our our home our headquarters in Nairobi. We only have people coming in once a week uh, to an office, and uh, we are definitely have seen costs to people's uh, mental health and happiness and ability to grow uh, in all of those ways. You grow just by absorbing um, uh, and, and, and informal mentorship and, and things like that. Uh, so I think that's uh, um, um, on our minds and something that's an opportunity and a threat. And then, of course, uh, um, on the horizon, or and, and, and the near term, um, artificial intelligence and the good and the bad uh, that that can bring to the work that we do. Um, um, we see lots of ways that generative AI can make our work better, easier, and enable us to serve more clients in a lower cost manner. And we're experimenting with different ways to integrate AI into our into our tech platform as well as our workflows, and that's exciting. We can talk more about that. Um, I also, though, uh, um, am nervous about what this can do to early entry level careers, uh, uh, particularly all of these remote digital careers we were just talking about. Um, it's unclear to me. And I think it's unclear to most people the extent to which uh, AI may be able to replace a lot of junior positions. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you're a mid-senior, senior engineer, you're probably going to be uh, enhanced in your ability to be productive by some of the tools that exist, like Copilot and, uh, and, and some of these other, these other things. Um, if you are, my, my nervousness is, do those tools essentially take the place of what are first and second year engineers or first and second year employees? And um, um, where will those learning opportunities, on-the-job learning opportunities um, come from uh, in the future? So I think we're, we're certainly very much monitoring the potential impact of AI. I'd be curious, your, your, your takes as well. I'm sure you're seeing that as well. Right. Even internships kind of take a backseat because there was, you know, like uh, those opportunities, just like you said, about learning and getting mentored um, early in the career. That seemed kind of a uh, you know going haywire. So uh, Paul, one of the interesting posts that you shared recently was um, uh, something about ABCD concept: always be connecting dots. So um, that was, I think, from a podcast that you had recommended. So uh, are you always connecting dots and collecting dots? Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, this is a this is a phrase that a, a restaurateur, Danny Meyer, uses a lot. And Danny Meyer has been a, uh, a kind of an inspiration to many in the hospitality world because of, of his unique view and ability to build relationships. His phrase, uh, ABCD, always be collecting dots, always be connecting dots. Um, um, is, is as kind of a simple shorthand for, I think, the best ways that you can be you know, networking or building relationships. Um, and I think a lot of the work that we do uh, as Shortlist, um, while it is built on a technology and data foundation, it's at the end of the day, human relationships. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're doing is trying to um, always be learning and growing about our clients, uh, uh, our clients' businesses, what's going on in the in the African startup ecosystem, uh, what's going on in terms of, of new uh, innovations in, in impact and, 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 and climate and, and things like that. But then how do we actually use those dots? How do we connect those dots in ways that the uh, uh, whole can be greater than the sum of the parts? So it's about uh, making making important uh, um, introductions when we can, connecting people that might not know about two different things happening, uh, so that they can use different uh, uh, bits of knowledge uh, in their work. It's of course in the work that we do, getting people into 
uh, the best careers for themselves. Um, so I've always liked that as kind of a little reminder of, um, of, of uh, how to go about not just learning about people and, and knowing people, but actually creating value uh, for those people around you. Right. No, definitely. I mean, uh, goes without saying that, you know, it's always the people that, you know, anything happens. Like if you want to do business or if you want to change your orbit, it will always be like people who can basically drive you towards greater things. So eventually everything comes around basically the people to people connect and the connection. In fact, I was uh, at MIT and there was this workshop and so this came to my mind about changing orbit with people. So they said, if you want to change orbit, and start working on exercise where you know who are the people who are in the next orbit and how well you're kind of connected to them. So, and, and then how what you can do I like you like start to be able to get to that uh, to near that to be nearer to them so that they can help you elevate you. That sort of uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. So Paul, you have been an investor as well. What's your investment thesis? What uh, are the things that you look into investing? Yeah, it's a good, a good question. I mean, uh, um, when I was more uh, actively investing, when I was running my own fund, uh, it was very much an investment a thesis around fintech. And uh, we were pretty early to the uh, now. Now everybody's a fintech investor. Uh, when I started investing in 2011, um, fintech was still really early in the process. Uh, and what what I was interested in then was the, the fact that uh, financial the it's kind of the world has been financialized so much of the world uh is impacted uh and and uh, involves financial services and yet it was still um pretty much the domain of big banks and big insurance companies and there was a lot of innovation that frankly was unlikely to be pioneered by big banks and big insurance companies it was going to be figured out more by uh, startups and very few people were investing in startups. So initially, it was uh, very much a, a, an innovation thesis around uh, the role of of startup led innovation in fintech. Um, that, of course, is not what I focus on now. I think what uh, what interests me now as an investor and as an entrepreneur is uh, um, um, similar uh, themes uh, around uh, the opportunity for startups to drive in innovation in these big sectors around uh, education and what I would call job tech, just generally the space of, of how, we, how we find jobs and how we work in those jobs. Um, I think uh, um, uh, the, the trends around this have been accelerated so much through COVID that we're now in a very, very dynamic, and now AI, we're in a very dynamic moment uh, for how people learn things, how they get access and exposed to jobs, how they actually get those jobs and how they succeed on those jobs. And when you have dynamic macro environments, there's often great opportunities for good entrepreneurs. So when I make my uh, today, I, I advise a couple of funds and I, I still angel invest a bit. I tend to focus my angel investments at the intersection of job tech and ed tech, and particularly where people are leveraging new trends or technologies that are uh, um, uh, going to meaningfully improve and change how we how we how we learn, how we work, uh, how we find work, um, um, and it also happens to also dovetail with my uh, interests in shortlist as well. Of course, I mean the more it is needed to the code, the more deeper you can go with things, basically. So I, I think it all makes sense. Yeah. So Paul, what's your vision for yourself? Um, you know, to reach by twenty thirty. What are the things that keep you moving? What are your passions and mission? I I I think we have so much more work to do to unlock the potential of the African workforce and to make it far easier to build companies and build teams on the continent. And um, um, I'm I'm pretty committed to uh, focusing on uh, the African continent for at least the next decade. And as we think about shortlist, uh, a lot of that orientation is 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 how do we continue to innovate and in how we solve people problems, human capital challenges for all of these companies we care about across the impact and innovation 
sectors, so startups and social so, social ventures and and NGOs and the rest. Um, so I think uh, uh, we're just getting started. I think the business lines we have now can continue to grow and expand in exciting ways. But I also anticipate we'll be introducing other uh, um, um, solutions that uh, that touch different parts of the human capital equation. And and I, I still think of this as a two sided problem, and you can't you can't address one without the other. So on the one hand, we've got to be oriented to solving problems for the companies, for the actual employees in this space. How do we make it easier for them to to hire to access talent? But um, um, very much we we keep front of mind the talent side. How are we at at a junior level? How are we unlocking the passion and potential of young people to find careers that they actually want to invest in and grow into? And at a senior level, how do we get executives um, into careers that are really uh, uh, energizing to them? And ideally, selfishly, where the talents of these senior executives are being uh, deployed against uh, big world problems. So we, we spend a lot of time trying to get executives from more traditional industry into more impactful industries in clean energy, climate, uh, financial inclusion, uh, health, uh, et cetera. And so I think uh, we've got just a lot more, a lot more work to do, um, uh, and a lot more work to build shortlist that we're excited about. Great. And what's your personal mission? <laughs> like you know, everybody has the professional goal and a personal goal that we'd like to see. Just continue to be a, as best I can, a great, a great person, a great friend, a great, a great uh, uh, manager and colleague, a uh, great husband. Um, um, I think uh, um, as as I get older, the importance of really caring about the, the the immediate relationships in our world and the community that we built um, has become so much more important to me. And so. Um, I think of uh, I think very much think of shortlist not as a family I think that's probably the wrong phrase but as a as a team or community that is so important to me and it gives me great pride to try to play uh, a positive role in in the career trajectories of our team but it also matters a lot to me that I'm making time for uh, uh, my family around me and and uh, um, um, friends and. Uh, uh, I think more and more that's how I'll be measuring success rather than just the. The business side makes a lot of sense because I think that brings so much human touch towards things, you know, subconsciously, even like the choices that you make, and it makes a lot of difference. Yeah, that's a good yep. vision to have. So, thank you so much, Paul, for giving us your time, and it's been a great exchange today. Thank you, and we wish you all the best. Thank you, I have a in the vision that you guys yeah to you too and thank thank you so much for the the partnership over the years from you and uh mine bowser we appreciate it yeah thank you